I'm sick of Paris. I'm panting for the fragrant woods, for the free movement of my belly in wide trousers and no waistcoat. I hate pavements, I hate palaces, I hate capitals, I hate columns. I love the beautiful column of the poplar and the fir. I love the vault of shady glades. I love the blackbird, the black cap, the woodpecker. I hate the horse, the cat, the house sparrow and the toy dog. I hate the steamer, the top hat and the dress coat. Puccini travelled the world for productions, Paris, London, New York, but he was only really happy in Italy and in the part of Italy where he was born. This is Luca, about 20 kilometres from the famous Leaning Tower of Pisa. Puccini lived in several houses near here and he's buried inside his lakeside home just up the road at Torre del Lago. These Puccini houses are stuffed with memorabilia, everything from hunting boots to manuscripts, and I'm making a tour of them with a Puccini expert from Northern Ireland who lives in Lucca, Vivian Alexandra Hewitt. We're going to begin here in a 15th century house, number 30, Via di Poggio. Um, a house which um, was the home of five generations of Puccinis. From they the were all in the music business, weren't they? All in the music business, five whole generations and all composers. And Puccini, our Giacomo, was the last. Um, it's said that he gave his small son a violin in an attempt to encourage him to become a musician as well. And um, shortly afterwards, he found this violin with an improvised sail bobbing about on Lake Massachusetts being used as a boat. He was furious, but there was nothing, nothing he could do about it. His son had no musical interests at all and instead dedicated himself to inventing motorcycles. But the Puccinis didn't make their money out of composing. Well, they did and they didn't. Um, they made their money mostly out of being organists. They were the organists of the cathedral in Lucca, and they were also hereditary organists of the church of San Paolino. Now, it seems very strange to us that being an organist is a hereditary job. But in the, in the case of the Puccinis, it simply passed from father to son. He, he did a terrible thing um, with the church organ once. Um, he knew that the price of lead was very high. And he used to go to a monastic order to play the organ there on Sundays. And uh, he was very clever at making musical arrangements that didn't require all the tubes, all the pipes. And one after another, he would remove the lead pipes um, from behind the organ. And after a while they began to say, but isn't that organ um, a bit funny sounding? Isn't there something strange about it? And he simply said, oh, well, you know, it's those old um, tubes in, in lead, you know, they need to be replaced. And slowly but surely he, he robbed them, sold them, and made a bit of money for his vices, which were, even at a very early age, shooting and smoking. Well, let's see what, what there is here in this first place. Yes. Yes, this is, this is the manuscript of the Mesa Quattro Voce. Now, it's not in Puccini's hand, this. Um, it's in the hand of a copyist, because Puccini wrote um, both his normal writing in letters and his musical writing in, in, a, in a terrible way, um, almost illegible, and he immediately had to pass it on to a copyist. Uh, he had a, um, a priest in Luca who was a friend of the family who understood his writing and um, had it immediately all copied out.
that I see there's a page, page of the vocal score of the opera Edgar with exactly That's the right. same tune. Yes. Same key and all. <laughs> yes. Um, it didn't of course, waste much, did it? <laughs> no, Puccini didn't waste anything. Um, they say in Italy that, um, rather jokingly, that Puccini um, is like pig's meat. You throw nothing away, because, of course, in Italy they use the, all the remains of pig's meat to make salami and so on. Yes, Puccini threw nothing of his music away. Um, we find time and again um, pieces of music composed for other things inserted into the operas. What is the character of, of people of Lucca, and, and was Puccini a typical Lucchese, or...? Well, it's always said that the Lucchese are extremely mean. Um, I don't think it's true that they're mean, but they're very careful with money. Now, in this respect, Puccini was a perfect Lucchese. He was always very careful about his halfpennies, um, believing that then the pounds would take care of themselves. But, you know, Puccini had a very conflictual relationship also with the people of Lucca and with the city of Lucca, uh, mostly because um, he ran off with a married woman with two, two small children, and that greatly shocked the local population. Elvira. Yes, Elvira. And she was, at the time that she left her husband, already pregnant with Puccini's child. And this meant that Puccini was persona non grata in Lucca for quite a while, and um, we have an idea of, of his strange love-hate relationship with the city um, through some of his, um, his poetry and some of his letters. There's a very funny poem, slightly obscene, that he wrote to his sister um, called Shit of Luca, um, which effectively says that even the shit in Luca is beautiful and sweet-smelling in the eyes of the Lucchese, because Luca is perfect to them. And so it's a very strange relationship. It really is love-hate. Mm. Where else ought we to go? I think Partner. perhaps to Celle, which is where these five generations of Puccini's came from. It's a, a tiny village in the mountains here above Luca, mm. and uh, it's rather beautiful. You can see the kind of place that Puccini came from, and indeed the place where Puccini, as a young man, went to hunt. Well, let's okay. go have a look. After the sacramental three performances, I'm going into hiding in the woods. There I shall vent my sportsman's rage on the birds and compensate myself for the suffering experienced during 30 or 35 days of rehearsal. Yes, in the green, rustic wilderness of the wonderful Marama, where nice people go, I think I shall pass the best days of my life. But are you mad to be out shooting after a success? It's the moment, the supreme moment, when the mind is really at peace. I want to make the most of it and I shall abandon myself to it. What do I want with banquets, receptions and official visits? Well, we've climbed up from a tiny little road, which seemed to be the back of nowhere. What, yes. 30 miles from Luca? Yes, perhaps just a little bit less, but it seems much longer because, of course, the road is extremely difficult. Mm. And in Puccini's time, you could only come by mule. It was mule. No, by mule, it was no good having all those motor cars that Puccini had. Um, there was no way of arriving except by, by mule track. And that is why, from his early youth um, until very late in his life, Puccini simply refused to come to Cerli. And here we are, right in, in the middle of a tiny piazza, um, just beside a, a very ancient church, um, the church in which um, the Puccini family played the organ, and um, a church in which Puccini, only three weeks from his death, came to play for the last time. Now what is this um, commemorative stone on the, on the buildings, hey? Yes, it's, it's a plaque that was placed there in those last days of Puccini's life, and it says this is to commemorate that in this house um, Giacomo Puccini frequently stayed, um, celebrated creator of immortal music, the 26th of October 1924, and that's just a couple of weeks before Puccini's death. Can we go in the house? Yes. Lovely airy room with wooden beams. They came here for summer halls? They came here for the summer holidays because Luca in the summer was extremely hot and anybody who had just uh, that little bit of money and countryside connections left town to come up here for even two months at a time 
um, to stay during the holidays. I think there's a very, very ancient gramophone. Yes. Can have a look at that. Yes, a wonderful gramophone. Now, I used to sell acoustic gramophones, but this is very, very much more ancient than that. Yes, it's one of the earliest gramophones, and it was a present from Edison to Puccini. Edison himself. Edison himself. And of course you know that Puccini had this great passion for everything and anything mechanical. Some really ancient looking records. Yes, ancient gramophone records. Puccini went to great pains to obtain oriental music at the time that he was writing Madame Butterfly. He wrote to all his friends, um, he wrote to the Japanese embassy. Um, he left nobody in peace when he wanted something that was necessary for his work. I had a visit today from Madame Oyama, wife of the Japanese ambassador. She told me a great many interesting things and sang some native songs to me. She's promised to send me some native Japanese music. I sketched the story of the libretto for her and she liked it, especially as just such a story as Butterflies is known to her as having happened in real life. She's at Viareggio, where I shall go to see her and take notes of what she sings to me. She's very intelligent and, although plain, is attractive. Let's go and look out of the window at the countryside. Yes. It's a wonderful green landscape. It's rather amazing when it's so hot. Yes, it's wonderful. Magnificent alpine territory, this. Um, we really have left um, the flat lands for high, high mountains. But if we want to go to the next stage in Puccini's life, we'll have to go down to the lake. Okay. The bog, I think. Down to the bog, <laughs> yes. <laughs> one of his, uh, which one was it, Ilica? One of his librettists? Yes, yes, sir. Uh, Ilica went to the bog quite frequently to find Puccini, and Puccini um, would write to him things like, leave that sewer of Milan in the summer and come to the bog. <laughs> right, here we go. Evening, water lapping against the piers. We're outside Puccini's house, Torre del Lago. Yes, the lake that inspired so much of Puccini's music. Um, it looks almost like an oriental lake. Um, it's somewhere between Japan and ancient China, with those mountains in the background and with this wonderful strip of silvery water in front of us. And, you know, of course, it's the source of a, the source of a direct inspiration of Puccini's. It's the source of the inspiration of um, something that the three ministers sing uh, in Turandot. They abandon themselves to a little reflection that it would be rather nice to go away from ancient Peking to their country homes right down by that little blue lake where there are all those reeds and bamboo canes. How pleasant it would be to live a private life. And you know, I think that's Puccini in a way, thinking of the life that he was forced often to live as a theatrical producer. Um, thinking how nice it would be just to arrive at Torre del Lago, put your feet up, sit in a boat on the lake and shoot at a few unfortunate birds. Parmi la mia vita, basti l'ar. 
What sort of a, a man do you think Puccini was? I think that um, we risk getting a completely wrong idea of Puccini the man because, you know, um, he has the great reputation of being a Don Giovanni, of being um, the great uh, powerful figure. He struts um, a bit in pictures, doesn't he? Yes, he struts a bit in pictures, but, but you know, I think Puccini was really a very, very shy man. Um, he also had... Um, a very strange relationship, I suppose, with women. He adored women, um, but certainly he kept falling in love with very domineering ones. Um, his wife, Elvira, was an extremely difficult and domineering woman who resembled his mother, who was also a difficult and domineering woman. And it's no accident, of course, that Puccini um, fell into the arms of Elvira, who was already a married woman uh, with two small children, uh, something like, I think, a month and a half after the death of his mother. Well, perhaps we might go up to the house now and have a look inside. Yes, I think so. Um, it's a rather quiet country house with nothing of the grandiose at all in it. Um, very strange because Puccini was certainly the wealthiest composer uh, in the history of the music of his time. And of course, even today, Puccini is the most performed composer in the world, I think. Well, I never thought I'd get to Torre del Lago, and of course I recognise this scene immediately with this piano and the pictures. Yes, here we are really in Puccini's own house, where he composed a large number of, of his operas. Which was the first opera that he composed ah, here? Ah, the first opera composed here um, was really the, the last part of Tosca. In the end, towards the end of 1899, the beginning of 1900, and really the first opera that Puccini conceived at Torre del Lago, was Butterfly. Isn't this the piano when he had one uh, pedal especially damped? <laughs> yes, yes, because of course Puccini composed during the night. Um, he was what the Italians call notambulo. Um, he worked at his best between 11 o'clock at night and 3 or 4 in the morning and he had the pedal damp because he didn't want to wake up the entire household, his wife, um, his adoptive daughter, his son and so on, so that he could work relatively quietly during the night. And then I suppose, once he'd finished, he would then uh, get his guns from, presumably, yes, from one of the, the next room, rooms. Just over here. And then go out in the boat. That's right, he would go out in a boat, um, sometimes all night. Um, unfortunately, nowadays, um, in this area on Lake Massachusetts, there are a lot less birds than there were in Puccini's time when it was full of wildlife. But he spent many enjoyable evenings there on the lake. Um, and of course, at night time here, um, it was also the scene of many of his amorous adventures. We don't know how often Puccini really went out to, to shoot at birds and how often he birds went out to look for, a, for birds of another feather. Right. <laughs> Thank you. 
desk masks, I see. Yes, the desk mask, a mask that was made um, after Puccini's death in Brussels, because, of course, Puccini died of cancer, having received radium treatment uh, in Brussels, one of those first people to experiment a radium cure. Now, the radium cure worked, but unfortunately, Puccini had diabetes and a very weak heart, and he died of a heart attack. And, of course, this desk mask rests on um, a large white pillow that was brought to him by his friend Sybil Seiligman, um, the wife of a London banker, who was perhaps his only really close female friend who was disinterested. In other words, not, I think, a romantic relationship. But well, nobody, of course, <laughs> nobody, of course, is sure about this. Puccini was a very handsome man. Um, Stravinsky, who was usually rather unpleasant about everybody, said that Puccini um, had only one vice, that he dressed too well and was far too elegant. And, of course, Puccini was a great um, conqueror of female hearts. Whether he conquered Sybil Seiligman's heart, nobody really knows. Perhaps um, she was the only woman with whom he could confide in serious family ruptures. Now, we know that the relationship between Puccini and his wife Elvira was always a very difficult relationship. And in 1909, um, a girl called Dore Manfredi, who originally entered this house as a nurse at the time that Puccini had a broken leg, um, was accused by Puccini's wife of having an affair with her husband. It wasn't true. This girl, unfortunately, subsequently committed suicide. January 27th, 1909. Dear Sybil, I'm in the depths of despair, and my position is irretrievably ruined. Doria has poisoned herself with sublimate, and from one moment to another, I expect to hear news of her death. You can imagine my state of mind. I'm done for. The poor child's relations are going to bring an action against Elvira for persecuting her. It's the end of my family life, the end of Torre del Largo, the end of everything. I've written to Recordis to straighten out Elvira's affairs, but I never, never wish to have anything more to do with her. Feel for me. I'm utterly broken. They're both buried here, Elvira yes, both and Yes, buried here, Puccini. yes. Um, a curious thing, uh, Puccini... In the very next yes, room. Yes, right Can in the very next look? room. Yes. It should be very unusual to find people buried in a private house. Yes, it's a very strange thing indeed. In fact, I believe that this is the only tomb within a private house in Italy. Very strange indeed. Um, but, you know, I think it... It comes from the desire that Puccini expressed to remain in Torre del Lago, even after death. He was very much in love with this place, and it's like a kind of homecoming for him. Mm. But this room, it wasn't conceived in any fashion, was it a chapel? Or? No, this room, I think, probably was used as a small sitting room originally, and then it subsequently became a kind of mausoleum. Mm. Let's go and look at some of the other rooms. Yes. Guns galore. Yes, guns and guns and guns. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine guns, nine shotguns, um, all Puccini's, 
shotguns and rifles. Um, in fact, in his letters, in his family letters, not the ones between him and his collaborators um, on operas, but in his family letters to his brother-in-law, uh, we find um, almost in every single case a reference to shooting. Um, he spent a lifetime writing letters to his brother-in-law, Raffaello, saying, go and collect the cartridges at the gun shop, or I've bought a new rifle, come and try it, or uh, let's get together at Torre del Lago, um, you leave your wife at home for a week and come and shoot with me. <laughs> no, in Jew, practically every Italian male uh, shoots. Yes, it's still a I mean, very, a, very popular hobby. Yeah. Yes. And I, I can remember on the days when you're suddenly allowed to, to shoot, I mean, the noise starts at about 3 o'clock in the morning. That's right. Yeah. And we all wake up with the sound of shotguns everywhere, mm -hmm. and um, it seems as if World War Three has just broken out. As well as uh, chasing birds and girls, he was also <laughs> great with the, with the traps, wasn't he? I mean, he had a lot of cronies here, didn't he? Yes, Puccini had lots of cronies, and most of them in the specifically artistic field. But, I mean, although he became a world-famous musician, he was really a man of the people. I mean, it wasn't a, I think a, a posh so. family. No, not like at that, all. I think he was quite an accessible man, and also, I think, a very charming man. Rather shy. He hated public speeches. Um, he hated to be in the public eye, um, but he had wonderful relationships with people um, at a very casual level. Yeah. Is it known how he talked? Yes, we know how Puccini talked because we have a record that was made by the Columbia Company, never issued. And how does he sound? Hmm. Puccini had what we would call today a countrified Lucchese accent. Um, although he came from a family that had quite a, um, a respectable social position, um, he had quite a strong accent and this rather clear, light baritone voice. Ringrazio con tutto cuore l'egregio signor Piafora per le gentili parole pronunciate. Sono veramente grato al gran pubblico di New York per le accoglienze tanto entusiastiche che ha fatto alle mie opere. Accetto l'augurio del buon viaggio e finisco gridando America Forever! <laughs>